So culturally responsive teaching is also learner centered. So I often put both of them together when I explain um, the work that I do, but really they're kind of one in the same, right? Hopefully you're seeing that when we're centering our students and we're thinking about their frames of reference, what's gonna be meaningful, authentic and relevant for them, that is in fact honoring their culture, right? And that is also how we make our instruction learner centered. So they really go hand in hand. So learner-centered instruction really starts with the existing background knowledge and frames of reference of students. That's the culture piece. And we have to remember that our learners already come to us with so much understanding. We have to move away from this, like we're dumping all this information in their brains and instead start with what's already in their brains, right? And how can we bridge from that to the new material? So how do we honor students' prior knowledge and their frames of reference in our ensemble rooms? Well, one way is to include them in the programming process itself. And I love that a few of you already mentioned some of the ways that you can include the, the students themselves in choosing what they're gonna perform. So here's a few uh, programming structures that you can utilize with your students. Um, either uh, throughout the year or maybe you pick one at a certain a certain time. One thing to remember is that when we're moving from like more teacher directed, and I'll show you a graphic, I think that makes more sense, but when we're moving from more, I'll just show it to you now, when we're moving from more teacher directed to student directed and led, we have to kind of think about how do we gradually release that power, especially if students are really used to doing things one way. Sometimes um, unfortunately, the system of schooling that we all exist in really focuses more on like getting the right answer or doing it the right way. And so I find that for some of my students, when I release too quickly to them, it can be really jarring for them because they're looking for what's the right answer, Ms. Cuthbertson. But where I'm trying to lead them to is a place where there isn't necessarily a right answer, right? So when we're thinking about how do we release power gradually, that can be a really powerful way to help move them through that process to independence without it being too jarring for them. So when we're thinking about teacher-directed and teacher-led, what it looks like might be that the traditional teacher chooses four to six pieces for the concert. The teacher makes all the programming decisions about what the topic of the concert is gonna be, how they're gonna rehearse, when, all, all of those things, right? That's the traditional way of approaching um, an ensemble program. But if we move a little bit away from that, where it's still teacher directed, but there's some student choice in there, it could look like the teacher still chooses, you know, several pieces, maybe six to eight, but then you find a way for your students to listen to those pieces and then let them share their feedback and tell you which of the pieces that they would prefer to do. Now, you still have control over the, the selection of pieces, right? So if there's particular concepts that you want them to work on, particular skills you want them to interact with, you're looking at how to balance the program, right? So you're going to include a variety of composers with a variety of kinds of backgrounds and maybe some different styles. So you still have control over that part, but then you're releasing the rest of the, the decisions to the students, right? Because you're allowing them to kind of rank in preference which ones that they would actually like to do. 